Hi, I'm Wayne Bellanoa, certified Wing Chun Kung Fu instructor and author of the Wing Chun Compendium series of books. I'd like to spend a few minutes with you today and give you an overview of Chinese Kung Fu, specifically the Wing Chun style of Chinese Kung Fu. First, I'd like to start with what is Kung Fu? Kung Fu typically refers to a martial art that comes from China. Kung Fu, or Gung Fu as it's sometimes pronounced, is a Chinese word, and regardless of the pronunciation, the Chinese characters for the term are this, Kung Fu. Kung Fu doesn't just mean martial arts. Kung Fu is a special word in the Chinese culture. And it's a word that doesn't exist in a lot of other cultures, which is why it's being borrowed from China. And the word specifically talks about that skill or that special thing that gets developed in a person who trains very, very hard under a recognized or accredited teacher. Somebody who's spent a lot of time to develop a skill to a really, really high level. When they perform or when they play that skill, whether it's an artist or a musician or a chess player or a hairdresser or a taxi driver, if they've reached a, a very high level of performance, an expert level of performance, they can be said to have Kung Fu. And there are a lot of different styles of Kung Fu. There are, there are birds behind me. <laughs> there are a lot of happy birds. There are a lot of different styles of Kung Fu. And typically the styles of Kung Fu fall into a hard or a soft style. What's called a hard or a soft style. And a hard or a soft style does not talk about how hard they can hit their opponent or how much damage they can inflict on their opponent. It talks specifically about how they deal with incoming energy. If an opponent punches at me and I block and my block is perpendicular and it goes crash or thunk and it makes a, a lot of impact, then it's a hard style of Kung Fu that I'm practicing. If it redirects or evades or leads the opponent into emptiness, then it's a soft style of Kung Fu. So both styles, again, I'll reiterate, both styles know how to uh, take care of their opponent. The differentiator in the style is how it deals with the incoming energy. Now Wing Chun Kung Fu is a soft style. It was developed by a woman and it was developed by a woman to be able to defeat larger, stronger people. So it's very has a very specific purpose. And because it was designed by a woman, to defeat larger, stronger people, it, it was developed to be a soft style. It was developed not to crash and smash because typically the smaller people just don't have the strength or the mass to deal with larger opponents in that way. So we are a soft style of Chinese Kung Fu. My lineage comes from Yip Man, who's Bruce Lee's teacher, through Moyat, through Sunny Tang, and then to me. And that's important to, to me because the lineage is an instructor's certificate of authenticity. So it says that Yip Man certified Moyat was able or capable or permitted to teach. And it says that my teacher, Sunny Tang, was taught by his teacher and is permitted or is recognized that he can pass along the real Chinese Kung Fu in the proper way. And I maintain a good relationship with my teacher, who also has certified that I'm able to teach. Because I follow that lineage, I represent or I've specialized in Wing Chun, because I follow that lineage, I'm going to take the spelling that Yip Man said. Yip Man said, okay, if you teach my style of Kung Fu, if you teach my style of Wing Chun, I want it spelled this way. This way. 
If you teach another styler, don't teach what I taught you. Then I want you to spell it whatever way you'd like. So again, I don't want to say whether those other styles are, are bad or good. I uh, frankly, I don't know. But what I do know is my style, my lineage is spelled this way and I've specialized in it. So when I talk about Wing Chun, of all the different styles of Wing Chun that may have been created or may exist, I'm going to talk specifically about this one. The purpose of Wing Chun is to create and maintain or restore a healthy physical body. Through character development, it's also going to help you to learn how to lead a happy life. And it'll also teach you how to protect that body, how to consistently be able to defeat an opponent in an environment where there are no rules using logical theory. Often this style of martial arts, Wing Chun, is called martial intelligence or the way it applies sound theory, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And speaking of the theories of Wing Chun, we believe that the most successful fighting method or self-defense method is to be as efficient in time, motion, and energy as possible. So to do that, we believe that a couple facts come into play. The first fact that we like to believe exists is that the shortest path between two line, two points is a straight line. We believe also that good body mechanics or machines as they'll be called sometimes can be used to redirect larger forces. And the other one, the third one, that comes into play fairly often is that the closer you strike to a rotational axis of a body, the more of that impact it has to absorb. So those are three facts that come into play to support our theory. Now, we have some principles that we follow that also support theory. Those principles are that, uh, those principles include trying our best to economize motion. That is, we believe the straight line is the shortest path, so we try not to move any more than necessary. We try to take the straight line wherever possible. We try to be efficient in time and win a fight in under three seconds. And we don't want to take any longer than necessary in our movement. And when you're fighting, time works against you. The more time you allow your opponent to attack, the greater the chance that he's going to get one of those attacks in. So we want to be efficient in time. And we also want to economize energy. We want to dissipate dissolve or release incoming force or incoming attacks instead of meeting them force on force or meeting them head on. So we'll economize energy. We'll try to move as little as possible in order to economize energy. So that's kind of a summary of our theory of fighting, how we handle ourselves in Wing Chun, some of the facts that support our theories, and some of the principles we apply to try and meet or prove that theory or try to manage how we operate when we're performing our Wing Chun Kung Fu. When performing Wing Chun or when using the Wing Chun style to fight, there are a few guidelines that we follow. I'm going to go over those with you now and sort of explain them a little bit. We won't take uncalculated risk. That is, we're a risk-adverse style. We believe that risks don't promote consistency. 
And since our style tries to be able to consistently defeat larger, stronger, skilled opponents, taking risks doesn't doesn't play in that, that favor. So we don't want to take unnecessary or uncalculated risks. We also prefer prevention over reaction. So instead of allowing a risk or allowing an emergency to happen, we're going to take steps to make sure that that emergency doesn't happen. So as I like to say, we would prefer to be a better electrician than a fireman. So we're going to try and avoid uncalculated risks. We will try to redirect incoming force since we're a soft style. We believe a soft style is better suited to handle larger opponents. I'm going to give an example of these coming up, so we'll talk about them now just quickly, and then I'll give an example and a demonstration so you can put a little bit of, uh, get a little bit of a better idea how these are applied. We will train to have a calm mind. We believe a cluttered or angry mind makes mistakes. And a cluttered or angry mind causes muscle tension. And if we want to redirect or divert or avoid incoming force, having tension is, is our enemy. We want to be relaxed and fluid so we can avoid that incoming force. We also want to specialize or become a master. We believe specializing or mastery gives us a statistical advantage, better odds against larger or skilled or difficult opponents. So we feel that we want to train harder and really build high level skills as opposed to taking a generalist's approach. We want to have two hands controlled by one hand. That is, I want to use one of my hands to control both of my opponent's hands. So I have a free one to strike, and they do not. I want to be able to reach my opponent while my opponent can't reach me. I want to protect my rotational axis, or my vertical center line. I do this because I believe it's a good way to protect my entire body. If I can protect my center line, I should be able to protect my whole body or my boundaries in the front. If I can protect my center line, it's the same or similar as when a football or soccer goalie comes out of the net to cut down the angle my opponent will have a more difficult time reaching me. I want to do simultaneous block and attack. I believe, we believe, it's more efficient to use both hands at once than to use one hand and then another hand. We believe that takes longer. So at the same moment we block, we also hit. We want to face our opponent squarely. If I face my opponent squarely, then they have more difficulty getting to my back, which is a valuable target for them. Also, if I face my opponent squarely, I can use both hands at the same time. They're both in reach of my opponent. They both can reach my opponent. If I fight a little bit sideways, my back, as I said, was exposed, and this back hand has some difficulty getting to my opponent. Maybe not difficulty, but it's certainly further away. So it's going to take longer to get to my opponent. Much more advantageous, we believe, to keep our hand out here, where it's close to our opponent. So we can use the closest weapon against the closest target. We want to do our best to enter our opponent's boundaries 
while protecting our own. Not just enter their boundaries, but enter their boundaries while we protect ours. We believe that compromised boundaries equal risk. And we are a risk-adverse style, so we don't want to give up our boundaries if it's not necessary. We're a striking style because we believe that striking, if I can finish a fight with one punch, is more efficient than grabbing, grappling, joint locking, high kicks. I'm sure there's a long list, you can come up with a long list of fighting styles that are less efficient than simultaneous block and strike, which finishes the fight. We believe that loss of balance or going to the ground are risky methods. And because they're risky, they're not suited to smaller people. So we avoid losing our balance. We try our best to stay balanced. We use good footwork and good structure to make sure that we're not toppled over. Our style is designed to be used against somebody twice our size. But not just usable against somebody twice our size. Also means teachable to somebody half our size. So I have to be able to show these techniques to somebody smaller and have that small, smaller person build or have confidence that that technique will actually work for them. It's not uncommon to be taught a technique and think, I would never use this because it would never work. And we want to make sure that we don't have that as part of our system. People will have confidence that these logical methods have enough substance and enough capability that they will work for the smaller person. For economizing motion, we also want to do our best not to step back. So to step back, only to step forward, is not efficient. It also imposes a little bit of risk, so we want to train to to have a high enough degree of skill that we don't have to step back. We can charge into our opponent's boundaries, protect our own, hit them, and uh, hopefully knock them down or win the fight. So uh, we don't want to step back only to step forward. And we especially don't want to step back only to have to step back again. You can understand how this is not efficient. The other thing, the last thing that I want to uh, talk about specifically is something in Chinese martial arts called the Six Harmonies. And we apply this, we try to apply this consistently whenever we can. And the Six Harmonies is a way of moving the body so that the body can maximize its power. And the Six Harmonies simply means that the wrist moves in line with the foot and that the elbow moves in line with the knee and the hip and the, and the shoulder are connected so when we move the whole body moves together when one part starts every part moves and when one part stops the whole body stops so we always use our full body our whole body to generate power into our strikes so I hope that gives you a good overview of the Wing Chun system and what we try to accomplish with it. In the upcoming DVD set, we'll step through each element of the curriculum. We have a 108 step curriculum and we're going to step through and build one piece at a time, build the individual components and then clip them together, kind of like Legos. Clip them together to build a comprehensive method of fighting, of applying all of these objectives of Wing Chun. As we go through each section, we'll talk about 
how this technique is taught in my schools. We'll teach it to you as I would teach it to them, to my students. We will talk about some common mistakes that we see. We'll demonstrate, give you some drills and ways to practice. And we'll also give a little bit of additional reading from the textbooks. So we're really going to give you everything you need to understand and get some experience and get some skill with the Wing Chun system by following the next nine DVDs. I put together a small sampling of the DVD for you. I, I selected a number of clips that I think you would enjoy watching that'll showcase how I teach, the demonstrations, the quality of the video. So you'll really get a, a good idea of what's involved in this, this DVD set and how it's produced and how it's presented to you and hopefully get a good idea of how much you can actually learn from it. So enjoy the, enjoy the video. Thanks very much for watching. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, bye for now. training stance for our Wing Chun system. 
is called E.G. Pinyama, and it means a character to adduction or a clamping stance. And it's our method for to learn how this works. Move this one out of the way, push and pull. Move this one out of the way, push and pull. There are a few common mistakes when it comes to the sun punch. The most common one that we So for an application, we can take this one, and let's say Tony punches. I can block, and then I can hit. And then if he punches. Circling hand. Pull your elbow back, keeping your wrist on center. Drop your fingers, turn them towards yourself. If the distance is right, your fingers should touch your body. Push the elbow out again. So again, if there's a jab or a straight punch, yeah. And this front jab comes out, I can put this, make the connection, and then as I'm going in, do the lock. lock. So I can just, how we're going to advance into our opponent. and tie it together with some techniques. start to take a few of our smaller skills that we develop and integrate them together into a larger, more complex skill. So what we're going to do is take these hand techniques that you learned, Hakda Tan. Little bit of a bend, same bend that we had earlier when we started to open the form and then lift. Keep your knee out so your foot is angled at about 45 degrees angle. If I think there is a chance that they could impose some risk to my punch, then I just use it to control and trap and gain space. And then hopefully with my next technique, I'll have them controlled enough. My tempo and try to minimize the amount of sway that you have. We keep our, our jong sao on center and we'll change it as we rotate. So we'll rotate just this far, probably about 45 degrees this side and 45 degrees this side. Hit, hit. For today's homework, I'd like you to read page uh, 156 through 158 from volume 2. So when you play your circle step, sink and drive off the back leg, drive off the back heel. When you push through, when you push through a door, So when we're doing this one, we extend the taunt out. Yeah, that's the one. When he throws that round kick, I can take the straight line 
and kick out that supporting leg. So that's one of the more interesting ways to apply this. It's just to take out. For the running and catching, Jiao Sao and Chip Sao, we want to teach a habit. The habit is if somebody goes, if a hand that's underneath you disappears, you flip to Tan. Because if it's underneath and you've blocked it, Tony will put the Fu Sao on my bong. And we both have the same techniques here with other, other hands, opposite hands. And then, because bong never stays, we'll change, change positions. I have ton, I have bong. And we're to see how we do the sticking, how we stick together. Watch, follow along, have some fun. We'll start just with one side for now. moving and the other's not. And another mistake we see is where one rotates and the other doesn't. And it rotates quickly at the end. So we want to make sure that timing looks really good. Fire the hands right up the middle. Should be able to get there more quickly, deliver the power we need and the confrontation. For today's homework, I'd like you to read from volume one, pages 75. The chest and safe area, no missing teeth. Sure, I get my fist there first. So before he punches, I punch. Do that again. So we have to make sure we have simultaneous block and attack here. Same one. Uh, we're going to have both, uh, uh, both of us working towards trying to get decent, uh, decent techniques in. We're going to try not to speed up. We're just going to have a good discussion and punch. So if there's no, stay down. So if there's a low punch like this, you can step in, use the gun. So one more time, people will may throw a low punch. And if they do that when you're stepping in, I can use Jut and sink my stance and use this to attack. I can also, let's just switch sides here, I can also use Jut this way. <laughs> yeah, sure, that'll do. When he brings this in, as this came through, it's a little bit too close, a little bit not enough control. When I come through, I'm going to hit here. So we want to make sure that there's enough space. What do you need for Ganda? Let do. How about this? And punch. Have good timing. Bad timing. Oops. Also bad timing. Ah. <laughs> so we're going to go over the unstoppable techniques now. 
and the unstoppable techniques are not a secret to success. They're a little bit the opposite. They are techniques that take advantage of the Wing Chun. The next one is a flying elbow technique, which again, looks reasonable and dramatic if you don't know what you're watching for. But what we're going to do essentially, I'll just show you with this one hand for clarity, is we're going to, instead of hitting along the center, is I'm going to lift up with my bong, put my bong too high, jut down here, open him up, and then I get the option to either hit here or hit here. It's pretty easy to get a hit in if I do this technique. Go ahead and stop me. I don't want to say that these situations, that these techniques, will you'll never find a situation to use them in a fight. I don't want to say that they're bad techniques. But what I will say is of how Wing Chun actually fights or how we engage an opponent. You can use this as a measuring stick to define whether or not the technique you're doing is reasonable for your training method. This next technique should pretty much do the job. So there's one potential application to use that shifting power, that rooted power. Another we have in Chum Q is this part. Some footwork that gets applied. And I'm going to I'm going to catch that incoming fist. A little bit slower, a little bit faster. Hey, there's that gone we were talking about. We're going to target the chest so we don't have any injuries. Shifting on the toes or moving the heel. For training our rootedness, for staying rooted, we want to make sure the heel stays planted. The other mistake that I see when we when this gets played is control of center. The same way when you play Chi Sao, when you do your rolling, you're competing for center but you're not pushing sideways to do it. There's a mini competition in there. So we want to do the same with our legs. Next step to test your balance. We're going to play the same drill, but without holding on to your partner. Today's homework, I'd like you to read from volume two, page 164.
techniques and of course hitting. So watch as we play the toy ma. Pay particular attention to how I'm going to put some distance between us and then Tony will recover the distance. We're putting a little bit of heavier energy and a little bit of stance into the techniques to help develop and train for that, uh, for that eventuality. One thing that's interesting is we have to do a lot of this type of training because we are reforming and reshaping the tendons. So it's important to do a lot of practice. When I get a good trap, I'm gonna fly that hand up to the face. So keep an eye on that. When my foot lands, my hands have to stop. So I don't want to. In this sticking legs drill, in this section, this phase, we're going to have free attacks and free defenses. So uh, one partner will attack in this section, in this part, it's going to be the sea hang or the sea foot. So I'll do the attacking. I can do any attack. So I'll teach you the first part of BUG form now. We'll start with our feet together just like we did before. Raise our hands, two fists, sink our weight just like before. But this time we're going to do something a little different. Because we already... This is incorrect. When we hit with this we want to make sure we move this pointy part of the elbow. So we hit with that part. So when you play this PUG, when you play this elbow, make sure it comes down. Elbow first. The other thing... So we're going to remove some more rules again and practice that you'll need some specifically developed muscles to make that happen. It's very valuable, brings a lot of power into your technique once you've got it. For today's homework, I'd like you to read from volume one, page next part of the BUG form, stems again from timing. After this, when we perform this piece, here. I want good timing, so we don't want this kind of thing. Because I can step into your boundary. But you can't step into mine. Uh. If you step in, because of where our heels are, if you step in, you step in over here. But if I step in, put your foot back where it was. I step in, I go in. So anywhere from, I guess, right about here, all the way up to here, in, anywhere in this area here, from the side, you see, anywhere in, in kind of here. You can use the ganda. You can do both. The mansao is used for that situation where you don't know what they're going to do. And we want to just throw something up on center. Next part of BUG is the BU section. You know there's been BU before, but this is the part that has most of them. And we'll start with our, from where we left off with our starting position. Have your chi sao, build your skills, have some fun. I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna put some, some, we just play the normal chi sao. 
so I can learn, teach some long range hitting power from this section of the form. Again, when we play this part of the form, we want to make sure that we're moving our body, uh, we're moving a fight from a compromised position. For today's homework, I'd like you to read from volume one, pages 378 through 395. Make contact with the arm, reach through up the middle, and shift with lock, double lock. Bong. Step to the outside. Tanda, control, strike. Or, if you prefer, control, strike. But we want to play some wrist action, some inch power into this, into this technique. So when we play the form previously, tuxa, block center, block center, block center, ton, low. So the next section of the form starts with Ganda, so follow along with me. Ganda, Ganda, go in towards center, Ganda, Bong, one more time. Follow along for the last part of the dummy form. Put our feet together again. Prepare Ganda. Bring this leg to the side. Barring pole drill. You put the end of the pole in your palm. Measure. So put the pole in your armpit and reach down the pole and this should be a good measurement for you and use the back like a lever. Point the tip upwards. Then we'll step down into low stance and keeping this right arm straight, we'll thrust. This measures. Then one person will view. So just like the same view that you learned before, there it is. And my job is to use tiu in this case because my pole's underneath. Use tiu. The next part of the Lokimbun Kwan form is Tan Guan. So Tan pole. And to do Tan Guan, I'll just show you before we get into the pole part, one of the details. First, when you do Tan Guan, from where we left off, one more time, Follow along for the final part of the Lokim Bung Kwan form. Through 368. 
floor. Drop back to center. V block with the left in front. Again with the shift, one. Yundo, circling knife. Chop, chop. And then again with the right in front. Circle. One, two, three, four, step back, check, two, three, four, brings us back to the same spot. So we're going to play 